Well, good morning. We're going to kind of part three of uh, Bible basics. Um, and I, one of the things that I um, kind of mentioned about all of these series of lessons I've been doing the last few weeks, they all come out of a, uh, a series of studies that I have been uh, preparing for the last, over the last five years, specifically to try and help people who don't have a lot of religious experience or a lot of Bible literacy. Um, and so I think in our, in our culture, our society, more and more you run into people with, with just don't understand much about the Bible, don't know much about it, don't have a lot of history with it because, um, you know, we have done that over the last couple of generations, uh, removed it from the public square and fewer and fewer people go to church, and probably fewer and fewer churches spend a whole lot of time teaching the Bible, uh, a whole lot more about having a service that just kind of, you know, uh, a lot of singing and makes a lot of people feel real good uh, for a short uh, time. And so these lessons all kind of come out of those attempts that I've been doing for the last number of years. And I really come back to this place, uh, as I talk about it, Acts 17, and that is that God, we're all God's offspring in this lesson that uh, the Apostle Paul taught to the Greeks at, at the Areopagus. That is all of us here, all, everybody who's at home today, everybody who goes to a re different religion, everybody on the face of the planet are all God's offspring. And that he desires every single person, since he created mankind, to search for him, to seek after him, to try and find him. And that he has given everybody on the face of the planet some things to find, to understand about God, to understand his power. That ultimately somebody who could make all of the universe and who could make us and is our, you know, creator is also our judge, which is the point Paul makes, by the way, in that lesson in Acts 17. Um, and so for all nations and all people, um, there have been, there have been, there have been, I guess, what's the right word, um, evidences that there is something beyond just what we see. And God has given himself a testimony in all that we see around us and all of the creation and the stars so that we don't have an excuse. Whether we know the Bible or don't know the Bible, whether we read the Bible or don't read the Bible, we still won't have an excuse when we stand before God to go, well, I, you know, I didn't know. It's like, no. No excuse. Now, so most of the world, I would, I think, in the throughout its history, have been people, as Paul mentions, really about feeling around in the dark, groping to find God, and that that is there is something you can know about God by looking at just the evidence around us, but. It's a whole lot easier to find God with the light. And that that's the purpose, essentially, of the scriptures. That's why it is a, a lamp to our feet to light our path. It helps us know God and find God. It helps us to understand God better. That that's the purpose of the scriptures. It is more evidence, more uh, illuminating and understanding but it's also why a lot of people reject it right because when you turn the light on now you have even less excuse a lot of people prefer to be agnostic in the world I don't know I can't figure that out well how much how much effort do you do to figure it out well they don't really do anything really they're comfortable being agnostic I don't know it's too hard because a lot of people would like the idea of, it's kind of like in politics, you know, for ever, one of the great lessons I think politicians learned 
from the scandal in the 70s of Nixon's, uh, you know, the, the Watergate scandal, is that ever since then, those in positions of authority would have underlings do things, but don't give me any details and don't put it on tape, so I have plausible deniability. I think that was really the great lesson that politics learned from the 70s, wasn't that we shouldn't do things like that, it's that I gotta figure out a way to do stuff like that without being able to get caught. And I think that's, that's human tendency. We still wanna do some of the things we wanna do, but we would like a, an excuse, a plausible excuse that, that gets me out of, so I can have a little get out of jail free card. I think a lot of people want that. A lot of people even talking about God. It's like, well, you know, I'm not sure if there is a God or not a God, but maybe going to church and he'll, he'll feel good about that. Like, whether you go to church or don't go to church, that it's not the point. The point is finding God, knowing God. It isn't about religious actions and just doing things. It's about learning, about growing and knowing and finding God. And so... The gospel, which isn't just the New Testament, but really all of the scriptures, which is about the Jesus, who is really the essence of the gospel. That's why Abraham could hear the gospel when God told him that your son, you know, that through you, I'm going to bless all the world. That is the heart of the gospel. And it is the gospel that God uses to call out into the world for those who, will, who would like to find him and seek after him. And so we went through these passages a couple weeks ago. And then last week talked about God's desire. His desire for all of his offspring is to have unity with them. And I don't know if all of you had a great uh, you know, Thanksgiving. You know, hopefully you got to see your family, be around family. And, you know, and ideally, if you're around your family, hopefully it's, it's positive. It isn't for all families that in the holidays time. Some, for some families, you know, holidays with the family become, you know, who's going to, what arguments are going to get started, you know, who's going to get drunk, uh, who's going to, you know, at which point will the arguments and, you know, fighting start. And for some people, they grow up with that. <laughs> um, and... So sometimes holidays are not something that people look forward to. And yet a lot of times people still go to them feeling an obligation to be around their family, even though experience tells them this isn't going to be wonderful. Because I think at the heart of it, we understand this idea. The idea of family helps us understand this is my family. For better or for worse, this is the only family I've been given. And, you, and there's a commitment to that family to some degree. And even if you're estranged for a time, you can be estranged for decades and something can happen that brings you back together. And because we all have, a, in, I think, an, built into us a desire to be united with other people. And I, that is built into us from God himself. Because that's God's desire with all of us. That he desires to be part of us and with us and to have us all in his household, in his family. But he wants us all to recognize that and he wants us all to choose it. Not just be forced into it. And so, 1 Timothy 2, by the way, there's the passage that I had the uh, last week. I ended up, I read 2 Timothy 2 and kind of went, I don't think this is a passage I wanted. Well, I knew it wasn't, but I couldn't quickly find the one I was looking for. I instead of, I put 2 Timothy in, as I typed it in last week, instead of 1 Timothy 2. And that is, you know, the verse um, 4, by the way, is the one I wanted to focus on is, uh, well, 3 and 4, I'll say, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants all of us to be with him, but he wants all of us to be saved in his household. 
And he wants us to understand what is real and what is true. Um, and so, kind of continuing on today, and uh, coming back to a theme from a couple of years ago, um, in 1 Timothy there, verse 15, Apostle Paul wrote about a, a saying being trustworthy. So it appears that he writes this, that he's actually telling them, kind of confirming to them some saying they already know. And that is, he says, he says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I suspect that is the saying they already were aware of. And he's telling them this is really a good saying and you should really accept this. Now he adds to it, of whom I am the foremost, I don't think the saying was, you know, Jesus came into to the world to save sinners of whom Paul was the worst. And so I don't think that was the saying. I think he's adding on to the idea that if from his perspective, he is the most prominent sinner he knows. And I actually did a lesson a while back that I suspect all of us, the most prominent sinner most of us know is ourselves. Because there's no other person that we know, that we know more of their sins than ours. We might look at some people and go, well, they've done worse sins. We might look at certain people and go, wow, the sins they've committed, those, those were heinous, those were awful. But I don't know as many sins. I don't know all the sins they've created. You could take the worst human beings ever, and I still don't know all the sins they've created or that they participated in or practiced. I know mine, at least some of them. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand all of them, but I, I know mine. And they kind of are always there reminding me that I'm a sinner. And I'm the most prominent sinner I know. And I think that's exactly what Paul, the point he was making. And this is the reason that all of us need to find God and why we need the gospel and why we need Jesus is because he did all of that to save us from our sin. And it isn't as if it's just God that makes us sinners. You can take people who are atheists, you can take people who are agnostic, and don't, maybe there's God, maybe there's not a God. There's hardly, I don't think there's a single human being on the planet who is old enough, who has a conscience that works, <laughs> that doesn't hold themselves guilty of something. Whatever their own maybe standard for right behavior is, I don't know anybody who's never violated it using just their own standard. And so that all of us need not help just from what God says we are, but from what we say we are. We're, we say we're sinners. We, do, we, we decide and we think we know what's right. We don't always do that. Who's going to save me from that? That, by the way, is the point of, in some way, part of the point in Romans chapter 7. Who's going to save me? If I, I say, oh, this is the right thing to do, and I don't even do it. One of the points Paul makes there in Romans 7. But he says, Jesus Christ came to save us from us. Not just from God. God's our judge. He's our father. He's our creator. But the problem is us. And that's the part, thing we need to recognize and we need to understand. The problem isn't God. The problem isn't religion. The problem isn't some standard. The problem isn't politics. The problem isn't government and authorities and abuse of power. And the problem is me. Even when I know what's right, I don't always do it. And so he came to save me from me. In Isaiah 59, he talks about this to Israel. Back there. In Isaiah 59, first eight verses, we're gonna, and, and highlight, kind of highlight verse two, but I want you to see this idea because Israel had a sense. Well, you know, hey, we're God's people. We're fine. We got his temple. 
He loves us more than all the rest of the people in the world. Now, that's not true, but they, they often thought that. They thought they were more special. What made them special was actually not they were better. It was they were chosen to do a job. And the job they were chosen to do was to be the children of Abraham, to bring forth the Christ so that all the world might be saved and blessed, which is the gospel that Abraham heard. Their job was simply to be the children of Abraham. They were no better or no worse than any other, other human beings. In some ways, they were worse because they understood what was right and didn't do it. But he said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. So it almost seems as if the people of Israel thought, well, you know, God, God's just not helping me. He, maybe he's just not powerful enough. Maybe he can't hear me. Maybe he's too busy. And Isaiah's telling him it's just not, that's not true. It's not that he's incapable, not that he can't hear. He says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Notice what he said there. It isn't what God did that caused the separation. It's what I did that caused the separation. And he says, For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. No one enters suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies. They conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs. They weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies. And from one that is crushed, a viper is hatched. Their webs will not serve as clothing. Men will not cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. It isn't who they were. It isn't something inherent about them that made them good or bad. It was what they were practicing and what they were thinking about. Their thoughts and their actions were how can I hurt? How can I get what I want and make sure I take from that person? How can I all these things that I desire? How can I get from them? You actually see this this idea of envy being this root that sets in, that causes us to kind of come up with the idea that, you know, the ends justify the means. You think about that idea, that perspective that, well, that what I'm trying to accomplish, whatever it takes to accomplish that is fine, no matter how evil it might be. Where does that come from? It comes from the root of envy. Because other people have stuff that I don't have. And I get to take it from them. I get to figure out any way to take it from them. Whatever that may be. Whether it's even their life or their stuff. Or, you know, their, said their people. Whatever it might be. Whatever it takes. It's the root of envy. And they ran to it. They thought about it. They considered it. Now, this wasn't the worldly people. These are people who had been taught by God, his priests, his prophets for generations. And that's what they're like. And so the idea that we need saving is not something for those out there. Doesn't matter where we are where we go, what we believe, all of us need his saving because of us. And so Romans chapter 3. And focus here initially on, on 9 through 18. When in chapter 2, 
a uh, little background. Paul basically lets the Jews know that they are not any better than the Gentiles. Which, by the way, the Jews would kind of be like, wait, wait, what? And that's the anticipation that, that he's having. He said, you're no better. You do the same things. Just because you have the law of God, you think you're, you're, you think you're better. And it's a little bit like, I, I think I compare that to Christians who, who like, well, I go to church. Therefore, I'm better. Well, but, but you're better if you actually do better. <laughs> you're not better because you go to church. You're better if you actually practice those things. You're better if on Monday you're honest and faithful and trustworthy to your bosses, to your neighbors, to your that's what makes you better. And it doesn't make you superior. It only makes you practicing good, doing good. And so but the Jews would have struggled with chapter 2 in the book of Romans, that they're not any better than the Gentiles. And so he, he anticipates a couple of thoughts. In verse 1, then what advantage has a Jew? And he, and he goes on, talks about what value is a circumcision. He goes on to tell them there was value there. there is, just like there is value in going to church. But going to church doesn't make you do the right thing tomorrow. <laughs> but there's still value there. And so, you know, just like reading the Bible. There's lots of people who read the Bible to try and figure out loopholes to do what they want to do. <laughs> and, and, but that's not helpful. The point of the Bible is to read it that we can figure out what can I do. And if we use it that way, it has value. And then he comes down to verse 9 says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. So you have an advantage, but it doesn't make you better off. And he says, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now notice there that he actually quotes from the Old Testament and this idea that no one seeks God. For God, which goes all the way back to the very foundation of what I was talking about in Acts 17, where Paul talks about that's God's whole focus, is that we would seek him. Which, by the way, Jesus tells us is the promise. If we seek him, we'll find. That's the heart of it. You, when you think about your life and your understanding and your religiousness or your godliness, it's going to start with whether you seek it. Not how good the teacher is. Not how good your family was. Not how good, you know, some teacher or some, you know, the preacher or the elders or how good the singing. Or, it's going to start with whether you seek it. Do you seek God? Do you want to know God? Do you want to be with God? If you want those things, you'll find it. And so... He says, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. They understand that there is a God, but they have believed and somehow fallen into the deception that God loves them so much that he will not judge them. And so they don't fear him. And that, that's a problem. That was a problem for Jews, a problem for all the world. If we might understand God, but if we feel God is so loving and so compassionate, that, that our, if we define loving and compassion as he will never punish us, which, by the way, some, so many do, right? Well, God's loving. He would never punish us. That's not true. <laughs> it's not a true statement. But we, we sometimes believe it. We sometimes think that's the standard of, of, of love, that love doesn't punish. Love doesn't cast away. And so... 
he says in verse 19, well, I'll stop there, verse 18. Um, but I want to kind of continue on here in this passage. Because um, he's told us that all of us, we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. And the problem is a lot of us don't seek after the righteousness of God. We don't seek and the behavior with the understanding that God will judge us for what we do and how we act and what we think about and what we participate in. Um, and then he says in verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and that the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And, and this idea that the law, the do's and don'ts God gives us, they, they help us. What do they help us do? They help us understand what is right and what is wrong. They help us in a sense of accountability. And is what he talks about, that the world can become accountable. And he says, but it isn't the works of the law that justify us. Justify, by the way, means to make you guiltless, okay? If you, if you were to take like a, justify is essentially an accounting term. And if you were to take, in an accounting, you have kind of, you, you have your balance sheet, right? You got, you got your assets and, you, and you've got your liabilities and, you, and they, all, they balance, right? So, um, and, but a lot of times you might have in your liabilities, like you, ha you have a debt. Well, if you have enough money to pay it, you can pay that debt, right? But what if you have a bunch of liabilities and you have no assets? We call, in, in the world, we call it going bankrupt. <laughs> you can either get somebody to give you assets, <laughs> or you can go, I don't have any assets, and you bankrupt. But what God has done to justify us, since we don't have the assets to pay for our sins, he has paid them, okay, for us. So that he has justified us and balanced it. He paid the debt. Which we can go and find passages about that idea, right? The debt was paid. We can sing songs about that idea. And so the idea, but, but we can't do that by just doing good. Because let's say you go to, uh, let's say, you know, you, do, you commit a crime. You can talk to me anytime. Stop that. <laughs> uh, the uh, tablets are talking to me. Um, <laughs> you can commit a crime, and in, and in court, would they go, well, you know, a thousand, you know, they've done the right thing a thousand times. Does that offset the one crime you do? No. You can't offset the crime. You can't offset the violation of the law with keeping the law in a bunch of other places. That's the point he's making, okay? So now we come into, in many ways, kind of the heart of the early chapters of, of Romans. In the first three chapters, this is kind of the conclusion of all that Paul is talking about from chapter 1 to this point. Because in chapter 4, he's going to give us an example of what he's talking about and show how this example worked in the life of Abraham. But he says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Okay, So he put forward, the propitiation by blood is to have that to be paid for by his blood. And he says, this was to show, so here now in verse, here in verse 25, he's saying, what's the purpose of doing it like this? Why did God do it this way? 
He says, this was to show God's righteousness. So he's showing us his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, that's his patience, he didn't kind of, he doesn't punish people as soon as they deserve it. He is patient. He waits. He says he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just. And we're going to stop there for a second because there's two things he says that he's doing. By having waited and not punished people the way they deserved, waiting to this point that he could bring Christ to demonstrate. Because what did he do with Christ? He didn't bring Christ to bring new laws. He brought Christ so that we could see God better. That's one of the points that he makes when he talks to his apostles that he was going to go back to heaven and he's going to leave them. And they're like, you know, Philip asks him, well, you know, where, where, you know show us the Father. And, and he's, so, he's so disappointed in Philip. He's like, I've been with you this long and you don't know. I have shown you the Father. You saw me. And so you have seen the Father. And so... Jesus helps us know God better, which is the whole point of his scriptures, remember? And what he wants us to do from the very foundation is to know him. And so he says, but that he's demonstrating that he is just by Jesus, by his propitiation of his blood, he's demonstrating his justice. God being the judge, did he have, does he have the power to be merciful? Well, in most courts, the judge has the power to grant mercy. And I would suggest to you that God has always had the power to be merciful. But what he did in Christ was paid the price. And I don't know if he, could make, if he had to or he wanted to. <laughs> but he paid the price because he wanted to be a just judge so that the payment, the price of sin was paid. But it wasn't paid by me. I didn't pay the price of my sin. Jesus paid the price of my sin. And God did that so that he could demonstrate his justness, if that makes sense. And secondly, that he might be the justifier of the one who has faith. So he demonstrated his own sense of being just, right? He didn't just go, because okay. think about it. What would you say to a judge who people come up to you and go, okay, I'll give you mercy. And then another one person goes, oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not giving you mercy. We, would, we, would, might, we might claim that that judge is capricious, is kind of just picking and choosing which you know and not and not always being righteous and just in, in their judgments well but when the judge himself pays all of the payments and all of the uh is the one who actually justifies who who you know makes the um i was gonna say you know pays the Pays the, the, the fine or goes to jail, does whatever it's required. When the, just, when the judge himself does it, then you can't accuse the judge of being unjust. And so he is both just as our judge, but he's also the one who justifies. He's the one who paid for our sins. Now, all of that to help us understand why he wants to save us from ourselves. I mean, think about that, what he did there. Why would a judge do that? Why would a judge pay the price himself if he didn't want to help them overcome their own problem? It's not the judge's problem, is it? It's our problem. But he's given everything to overcome our problem so that we hopefully have that same mindset that Paul said is, of all people, I am the foremost sinner. I know. And Christ was given to help me overcome me. And that hopefully I can learn to know him better. Well, we'll end there today. I appreciate your, your time and uh, your thoughts. Um, for those at home, I, I appreciate 
you know, tuning in. I do know quite a few still do that regularly and hope that you're doing well. Um, we're going to close out this morning. But if you, if you have questions about Scripture, if you have questions about anything that I talk about, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, be happy to sit down, study more, uh, help you understand Scripture better if I'm able. Uh, and so all of us might continue to seek for God, to find Him, to know Him, and, and not only just to know Him, but then also to put that on ourselves, to try and walk in that same way so that we can be a child of His that pleases Him like Jesus was. Because Jesus Himself said He always sought to please the Father, and that really should be the heart of our attitude as well. We're going to close out by singing 915. Uh, but before I do that, you know, we, we do invite you to not only reach out to us all the time, but especially at this moment. If you're wondering about overcoming your own sin and what you ought to do, if you are struggling with sin, um, like I said, reach out to me, reach out to, to Dave, Rich, or other, other people, members of our congregation. Um, you know, we need one another, and we, it's helpful to confess our sins to one another that we might get not only ourselves praying about it, but having others pray for us as well. And so if you're here and you need, need that, if you need anything, we ask you to go ahead and let us know as we go ahead and stand and sing.